Um, so I, I just want to start off today by giving you guys a little inside scoop in how I prepare our sermon series and how I do some preaching and preparation beforehand. Uh, generally, when I develop a new sermon series, what I try to do is I try to capture the overall concept, the, the main focus and where we're going. Uh, a lot of churches, a lot of preaching circles would call this, I want to try to capture the big idea behind the series. Where are we going? What's the purpose of it? Now, I rarely share that with anybody. I developed this for me personally just to make sure I have a context and a focus of what I'm preaching on. And then there's times when we have other guest preachers step into the series. And what I'll do is I'll share that with them so they can have an idea of what this is all about. But guess what? I'm pulling back the curtain. Oh, I can see you're so intrigued. I'm pulling back the curtain this morning, and I'm just going to read to you what my big idea for this sermon series is right now. So let me just lead out by just straight up reading this to you. You can follow me along on the screens if you would like. How would you prepare if you knew a world-shaking event was about to occur? Some of us have experienced these events in recent history. Those that lived through the assassination of President Kennedy or experienced 9-11, or recently navigated the 2020 pandemic, understand that the world can change in a moment. Everything that was normal is suddenly flipped upside down, and in an instant, we find ourselves in a new reality. It's not pleasant to acknowledge that these things happen, but in our fallen world, they are an unfortunate reality. I believe as Christians, we have an advantage. We know that one day Jesus is going to come back and it will be the most monumental event in all of human history. In this series, we will explore how we can be prepared so we are ready for his second coming as we continue to navigate the shaking that is occurring in our world. It's time for us to become spiritual preppers. I feel like that would have been so much cooler if there was like background music behind it. Dum, dum, dum at the end of that. But I am, I'm excited about this series. I'll be, I'll be quite frank with you. I'm probably a little too excited about this sermon series. Uh, someone that I live with who, who shall remain unnamed. Um, I'm not going to say who this is, but she asked me multiple times, do you really want to name this series Prepper? And did you really create a logo with camouflage background? Like, for real, do you really want to do this? And, and I get it. I, I get why there's a little hesitancy and pushback. I, I totally understand it. But, but, Michael, why in the world would you create a series called Prepper with a camouflage background? First of all, it's camouflage, so you can't even see the background. So don't even worry about that part, okay? But let me tell you why I decided to do this series. I don't believe you have to be an Old Testament prophet to look at 2024 and see that there is the potential for things to get a little crazy. I mean, there's the potential for things to go a little sideways, and let's just start off with this. We have a presidential election happening this year, which means just hold on to your hats. We have two major wars happening in the world right now, in Israel and, and Ukraine, and, and there is a strong chance, we don't know, but speculatively, Taiwan could be contested. You know, our American troops are stationed overseas. We have one of our very own that's now in a place that we cannot name, and they're experiencing hundreds of attacks on our U.S. troops. So there's a lot of conflict brewing in the world right now. And you know what? If, if you don't believe any of those things, let me just say this. We are talking about UFOs on the news as if that is normal. Like, when did that happen? You turn on the news and you're like, okay, the UFO talk is a normal occurrence in the news now. That's not weird or anything. So I'm just saying our world is changing rapidly. And if you're like me and you pay attention to the news some, you may agree that sometimes that when people are reporting on factual and true events, it begins to seem like sometimes truth is stranger than fiction. I always preface with people like, hey, I'm the furthest thing from a conspiracy theorist, but sometimes when you believe true things these days, it seems like a conspiracy theory. My personal conviction is this, you don't have to agree, and I, and I really do mean that, I'm not placating you. I believe our country has some serious problems right now. 
I, I believe the trust in institutional government is possibly at an all-time low. Maybe there's a reason that way back in the 80s, Ronald Reagan said uh, this, he's quoted as saying this, that the most terrifying words in the English language are, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. And I think it's compounded because across the board, this isn't a political statement, but I mean across the board in our country right now, we do not have strong righteous leaders in place. It leaves us in a vulnerable position. Now, I mean this, that is my opinion. You don't have to agree with that, and I really do emphasize that. But but that's what I'm seeing right now. But even after I say all this, let me tell you something. I feel a dilemma inside my heart as a pastor, as, as a representative of the kingdom of God, of the gospel. I have a hesitancy as I say those things, and let me tell you why I have a hesitancy. If what I just shared with you right now causes you to experience Fear and anxiety, that is the last thing I want you to experience right now. That's the last thing and the last place where I want you to land at anywhere during this series. But on the flip side of that coin, as your shepherd, as your pastor, I feel I have an obligation to be a realist, to be pragmatic, and to prepare us for what could be ahead. And and let's just summarize it. The reason I'm doing this series called Prepper is so we as a church, as a people who love and follow Jesus, are prepared for anything that comes our way in 2024. I want to be clear. I have no desire to be an alarmist. I, I have no desire to give in to sensationalism. But let me just pause and just start here with this series as we go into this for six weeks. I've named this series Prepper. Okay, that's what I named it. Now, I'm not sure what comes to your mind when you read this word prepper, but maybe you think like this. You're thinking right now when you hear that word prepper of someone who has enough guns and ammunition to arm a small army. Maybe this guy's a little out of shape, has watched way too many war movies, has made a bunker underneath their house with walls full of canned food. Uh, There's barrels of water. There's a pickup truck that's outfitted with a 100-gallon tank and a tent on top of it. They're wearing a not-so-cool tinfoil hat. Like, listen, right, isn't that the stereotypical picture that we normally see? We tend to paint these folks as a little crazy. But let me just pause right there and give you a little food for thought, something I thought through as I was preparing this series. I believe this. Several decades ago, the whole idea and concept of being prepared wasn't as crazy. Let me get specific. My great-grandparents raised my grandma through the Great Depression. They navigated a time when there was a severe lack across the board. And let me tell you my experience growing up in my grandma's house. We we went there, and she made me wash the dishes. We had a, a Tupperware container in the sink to hold the water. If I dumped that water down the sink, she would yell at me. You know why? Because we're wasting water. I had to get that tub, go to the backyard, dump it on the pecan tree because she harvested every single pecan that came off that tree. You know why? She was prepared. She had stores of canned food and she had jars, not because she was a prepper, because she had lived through a hard, unfortunate reality that caused her to be wise and to be stored up to be prepared. Fast forward. 1994, I'm I'm two and a half months in Amsterdam with Youth of the Mission doing evangelism on the streets, leading people to Jesus. I become really good friends with a Russian guy named Pavlov. He was great, long-haired, loved music. In fact, fun fact, side note, not relevant to the series, we created a punk band that was absolutely terrible, but it was so much fun that summer. We were Christians, don't worry for you judging me right now. We had this great little punk band, but I remember we would go to Pavlov's dorm and he had these shelving around the, the top of his room, and he had bags of cereal and plastic bags just lined up on the shelves in the room. And I remember giving him a hard time, like, you know, what are you doing, man? Are you just eating in the middle of the night all the time? And a buddy of mine pulled me aside. Now, let me tell you the context. Every morning, we came down to our little cafeteria where we ate, and there was plenty of food, like literally barrel, barrels of cereal you could scoop out, and that's what he would do. He would scoop it out and put it in bags and tie the bags up. And my buddy pulled me aside, and he's like, dude, quit. stop giving him a hard time. He's from Russia. That was just communist a few years before. He's used to not having any food. 
And he's making sure that he does not run out. He's not trying to have snacks for later. He has food insecurity, and he is storing up food so he doesn't run out. It was very sobering for this little American kid to realize my good buddy who plays rock and roll is a great guy, literally is worried that he's not going to have food, even though to me I knew we're always going to have food. It was a different type of reality. Now, I think as Americans in 2023... I think we live in a land of comfort and convenience, and, and that kind of stuff is foreign to many of us. But the truth is this. I believe several decades ago, if you weren't prepared, you were probably a little strange. You probably had some stores in your house. You had a certain mindset to, to navigate hardship. But, but listen, I, I think we've, we've become complacent. I know I have, and I'm speaking for myself. I'm not pointing a finger at you, I'm pointing a finger at me. Listen, let me be clear. As I talk about comfort and convenience, sign me up, baby. Let 2024 be the year of comfort and convenience, not hardship, not bad things happening. I would love that. That would be great. But the reality is this. I believe as a culture, we've become complacent. I believe we've gotten a little soft. And I think this, that in my opinion, this whole idea of being prepared isn't just an idea that Michael came up with and thought it would be good to share to the church. I believe with all my heart this is a very biblical mindset. This is a biblical framework. This is a biblical approach for those of us who are followers of Jesus. In short, I believe this call and idea of being prepared is biblical. This idea has been around for a very long time. I'm going to get into that this morning, but before I jump into that, let me just share this. How many of you were a part of Boy Scouts of America growing up? I love the Scouts. I was a part of Scouting internationally overseas and got to do some amazing things. And, and do you guys remember what the Boy Scout motto is? Be prepared. Be prepared, two words, was the Boy Scout motto. I remember it growing up, one of the few things I remember from Scouting, but I remember be prepared. And it's an interesting motto for an organization of that magnitude that ended up having a worldwide influence on millions of young men. And someone asked the founder of Scouting one time, his name's Baden Powell, why be prepared as your motto? Let me tell you what he said. He said, the Scout motto of be prepared means that you are always in a state of readiness in both mind and body to do your duty and face danger, and if necessary, to help others. Now again, the scouting became a massive international organization that influenced millions of young people. I find it fascinating that they decided to have a very short and concise and focused motto, and that motto was, be prepared. Don't ignore that. So maybe this idea of being prepared, this idea of being a prepper is not so crazy, But let me tell you specifically why I'm bringing this series to Emmanuel Baptist Church. If anyone is listening online right now, or or if you're listening, like, focus on what I'm about to say. I want us as a church to let's be prepared and alert and awake for anything that 2024 throws our way. Listen to those words prepared, alert, and awake. But Michael, I can hear you you saying right now in your mind, I can read your mind, believe it or not. Not really. But Michael, what are we preparing for? What in the world are you talking about? Quite frankly, Michael, it sounds like you've drank the Kool-Aid. Have you been watching too much news lately? What does your house look like? Do you have tons of canned food stored up everywhere? Well, I'm glad you asked me what we're preparing for. So the two things I want us to be prepared for as followers of Jesus are this. One is the shaking that I see occurring in our world right now, in our country right now. I'll explain that a little bit more. The second is this. We are to be prepared for the return of Jesus. Specifically, I want us to be equipped as a church to navigate the season in front of us, to be prepared, alert, and awake. See, there's so many people I know right now I love the kingdom of God as a whole. I have so many friends that are pastors in different denominations and different movements and many, many leaders and pastors across different denominational Christian movements uh, agree that this belief that we are experiencing shaking and that we are living at the end of the age. 
Now, as I say that, let me be clear. What I am not saying is I'm not picking a date or a time, nor should we ever do that. Someone does that, run for the hills, that's not wise at all. But again, I think we should be discerning of the season in which we live. See, I think that we're experiencing birth pains as we near the end of the age. I believe the worldwide shaking is, is, is really lined up with, with these birth pains, and Jesus actually talked to them, and there is a chance they could ramp up this year. Now, let me be clear about something right now. I don't want to be an alarmist. If we get to December 2024, and you pull me aside on a Sunday morning, and you said, Michael, remember that prepper series you did, and you said you were concerned about 2024? Hey, this ended up being the most chill, easy year ever. You were wrong. You know what I'm going to say? Praise the Lord. I have no desire for this year to be spicy. Again, if we could sign up for like comfort, convenience, and easy year, sign me up, put my name on that list. I just don't foresee that happening personally. See, I feel like the world is being shaken. In fact, we saw in 2020, 2021, a global shakening. One of the reasons it was a global shakening is because of the advancement of technology and social media and communication. We truly live in a very small world right now. I've been to places that are greatly impoverished, and guess what I've seen? Many, many people have a cell phone. We are more connected as a planet than we've ever been. And when the COVID-19 pandemic hit, it was like the world went into this shaking together. And to me, personally, it feels like our nation is being shaken. I think a lot of the structures and the institutions that in the past we've looked at as being reliable and robust, it seems like there's a general untrust and unease that we're experiencing right now. Again, that's my opinion, and you could disagree, and you could be right. I'm not saying I'm right. I'm saying that's my perspective this morning. But, but I think this whole idea of things being shaken, I believe it's a biblical concept. Again, Jesus talked about the shaking in the coming of the age with the comparing it to birth pains. Now, I don't know how many of you have experienced childbirth. I have not. Praise the Lord, by the way. I just want to say, if it was up to men to give birth to children, the human race would die. Because I was there when our child was born, and I was like, Lord Jesus, I love my wife, and I'm so grateful. They are wait. You know, men, as tough as you think you are, you haven't had a baby, so chill out, okay? Yeah, yeah, women are pretty amazing. But I believe this whole idea of a shaking is actually a biblical one. In fact, I want to take you to what it talks about in, in the book of Hebrews. The author of the book of Hebrews talks about a shaking that will occur. And, and he starts off with this. He, he starts off by talking about the shaking that occurred in the Old Testament. Specifically, God appeared at Mount Sinai uh, to speak to the nation of Israel, and there's thunder and lightning, and the mountain is shaking, and their people are terrified. And there's this encounter with God that just brings this shaking this is what the author starts off with in verse 26, but then he says something else, so, so follow me here. Hebrews 12, verses 26 through 29, I'm reading in the NIV translation. He says, at that time his voice shook the earth. So at that time, at Mount Sinai, in the Old Testament, his voice shook the earth, but now, when? Now, he has promised, once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. The words once more indicate the removing of what can be shaken. That is, the created things so that what cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. I believe this, as our world draws nearer and nearer to the return of Jesus, we will see a, a shaking occur in this world. But it's for a purpose. And when I say that, I do not want you to be alarmed, and I'm going to double down on that here in a second. I'm not saying that to bring any fear or intrepidation, but there's a purpose for it. Now, ultimately, the shaking that we just read in that scripture will be fulfilled at the return of Christ. That will be ultimately fulfilled in the return of Christ. But if you study the teachings of Jesus near the end of the age with birth pains, and you start off with, with, with fake birth pains, what are they called? Braxton Hicks, right? 
And then you get the real, you get, oh, I have a whole story. I really want to go into the story, babe, but I can't. My wife totally messed with me at the birth of our youngest daughter. She was like, I was like, you, you can't walk right now. You can't go do this. And she was like, no, we're walking right now. Am I do jumping jacks? And then she started having contractions, and I'm like, quit messing with me. She's like, they're real. I'm like, no, they're not. You're fake. And she really was giving birth, but that's a whole other story. Has no bearing to the sermon. She got me good. Oh, my goodness. But listen, I believe the frequency of these birth pains or shaking will increase as we approach the end of the age. In fact, as I've been talking about, what if we want to read about Jesus' sayings on this, you can go to Matthew chapter 24, the Olivet Discourse. But here's the thing, the reason God is shaking, there's a purpose to it. He's shaking things to reveal that which cannot be shaken. See, we serve Jesus who is Savior and Jesus who is King. He is coming back to establish His unshakable kingdom which will last through eternity. And my personal belief is this. One of the reasons He's allowing things to be shaken is He's showing what cannot be shaken. See, the things in the world that we put our trust and confidence in will crumble before the kingdom of our God. The worldly systems that are inferior, the philosophies, the ideals, and everything that attempts to exalt itself before God will be revealed as temporal. Only God's kingdom, the unshakable one, is eternal. And the reality of this unseen eternal kingdom trumps the reality of the world systems that we see in place right now. And we can see our world just shaking and crying out for justice and things to be made right, and the right political system to be put in place to have this world set in order. And that is not necessarily fundamentally bad, but that's not going to be realized until the return of Jesus. That's the consummation of those desires. Everything not built on God and his ways and his kingdom will not last, period. But for you and me, a people who follow Jesus, we do not have to be shaken in our own lives. Hence this series for us to be prepared, to be a people who are not shaken when the world is shaking around us. See, we serve the unshakable king. His name is Jesus. We find ourselves now in the reality of participating in his kingdom here on earth. We are in the unshakable kingdom. We are invited in to experience very real joy and hope. We literally have an eternal inheritance coming our way, and we are ruled by the love of an amazing king, and his name is Jesus. And eventually the grand finale is going to happen. He will return for his people. He will return to the earth, and we will see the realization of his kingdom then established That should bring joy and hope and peace anchored in our souls. The one in whom we have put our trust is coming back for us. We will experience the fullness of that salvation. Listen, one day, whether voluntary or involuntary, every knee will confess, every voice will proclaim that he is the Lord. He will be revealed in his glory, in his splendor, in his wonder. And listen, whether you know Jesus or not, I just want to tell you, you need to know Jesus. I I believe in the DNA of every human being, there's a crying out, whether you're cognizant of it or not, that everybody in their heart wants a king like Jesus. Everybody needs a savior like him. He's better than you can imagine. It's a personal conviction of mine that we're in a season that we're experiencing some of these birth pains and some of these shakings. Maybe they're increasing in frequency. I'm not sure if you sense this also, but I know many of you who I've talked to also see those things. Again, we're living in very interesting times. Sometimes truth seems stranger than fiction these days. But I believe there's some things happening now that haven't occurred in the last 2,000 years, and hence this is my call to the church. Be alert, be awake and be prepared. Now, if this whole idea of being prepared seems a little over the top, a little alarming, you're even thinking to yourself right now, I'm not sure if I'm coming back to that church next week. 
It seems a little overwhelming, this whole idea of what he's talking about. Again, I get that. But I also want to state that's not my desire today is to bring fear or anxiety to you. But as your pastor, I want you to be prepared for the seasons and the times in which we are navigating. And the first step in being prepared is to be alert and awake. Now, for those of you out there who are real preppers, and in your prepping studying, you've studied safety and security, there's one thing that you learn right off the bat, so I've been told. It's called situational awareness. You're asked to develop situational awareness. By the way, I work two blocks south of Grant and Alvernon, and I tend to have situational awareness all the time because it's just smart where we're at in the city. It's a fundamental need of safety and being prepared is to develop situational awareness, but let me give you some context of how that could apply to our church. I believe we need spiritual situational awareness to be prepared, alert, and awake so we are ready for his coming. Again, before you think I've drunk too much of the prepper Kool-Aid, I promise you I have not. In fact, the call for us to be alert and awake in regards to the Lord's return is extremely biblical in nature. It's a Christian mindset that we should have. Let me take you to 2 Peter chapter 3. I'm going to read verses 3 through 10. Just pay attention to these words. This is what Peter, the apostle Peter, the rock says. He says, above all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come scoffing and following their own evil desire, they will say, where is this coming he promised? Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on as, as it has since the beginning of creation. But they deliberately forgot that long ago, by God's word, the heavens came into being and the earth was formed out of water and by water. But listen to the exhortation here in verse 8. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. We're going to talk about the character of God right now. If you want to know the nature of God, look at verse 9. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you. Why is he patient? Not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Yes, it has been 2,000 years. Why is he tarrying, as the old Christians would say? Why has it been so long? Because he is patient. That is the nature of God. In his love, he is patient, not wanting anyone to perish, but that we would come to repentance. But then he ends with this exhortation in verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with the roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. See, growing up Christian, as I did in a Christian home with my dad being a chaplain and a preacher, I've been in church for many, many, many years. Let me share with you some things I've heard from Christians from the early 80s. I've heard this be said over and over again. People have said this very frequently. I think... We're living at the end of the age, and the Lord is returning soon. I've heard that since I was a young man. I'm almost 50. been hearing that since I was a young, young boy. People have been saying that. I believe that we're living near the return of the Lord. And as soon as I would hear that, you know the next thing I would hear? Oh, people have been saying that for 2,000 years. I hear a lot of agreement. How many of you all heard that also? Someone says, I believe we're near the end of the age. Jesus is coming back soon. And immediately... Yeah, people have been saying that for 2,000 years. Now, here's the reality. Both of those statements are absolutely true. In fact, it's very biblical. If you read your New Testament, you'll begin to really see that having an expectation for the Lord's return is actually a very biblical framework to view the world and view the times in which we live. They were looking and viewing things all the way back in the first century church. We just went through First and Second Thessalonians. So both of those statements are true. Well, I believe we're living at the end of the age. And then the other statement, well, people have been saying that for 2,000 years. But here's a caution that I have for us when we hear that. Maybe you even felt that this morning when I say, I believe we're living at the end of the age. Here's a caution to us. It says right there that, that scoffers will come at the end of the age. 
See, scoffing means this. It means to make fun of something, to ridicule it. But I even think a milder form of scoffing is this. It means that we can easily dismiss something because we just don't want to believe it's true or we think it's been too long. I wouldn't do that. And here's the reason why. I believe it's a biblical call to be alert and awake. And, and I think if you just blow that off and dismiss that, we could be living in the end of the age and the Lord's return is soon. We do not want to be a scoffer, and that is an exhortation we have from Scripture. I think that it's easy for us to become weary and leery of thinking about the Lord's return. I get it. But listen, we are called to be a people that are wise, not unwise. We do not know the date or the time. Let me be clear on that. But I believe that we do have a call to be discerning of the times in which we are living. We have a call to be a people who are spiritually prepared for whatever comes our way. Now, it's been unfortunate in the last 2,000 years, there's been many people who have chosen dates and times and all that, and then that's ridiculous. That's really hurt this whole idea and mindset of Jesus coming back. And again, I'm going to emphasize that should never occur. That should not happen. But I promise you there's a lot of scriptures to back up this entire idea of being awake and alert and prepared for the Lord's second coming. In fact, let me just take you to a teaching of Jesus. Let me take you to Matthew chapter 24. I'm going to read quite a few scriptures here, but just, just listen to what Jesus has to say about what it will be like as we get nearer and nearer to his second return. Starting in verse 36, Matthew chapter 24, these are the words of Jesus. Jesus says this, but about that day or hour no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Then he describes to us what it's going to be like. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving into marriage, up to the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in a field, one will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding with a hand mill. One will be taken and the other left. Now here's the exhortation from Jesus. Again, remember, prepared, alert, and awake. Therefore, keep watch. Because you do not know what day your Lord will come, but understand this. Now he gives us an analogy. What does keeping watch look like? Well, Jesus shows us with a, a little parable here. If the owner of the house had known uh, what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch. It would not have left his house be broken and would not have let his house be broken into. So here's the exhortation from Jesus. So you also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. So again, if you're hearing me say, hey, I believe we're living in an end of the age, I believe I can make a very strong argument from Scripture why that's true, and it was true 2,000 years ago also, just to be clear. But if when I'm saying be prepared and alert and awake, and that feels alarmist or a little strange, or I don't like the way that makes me feel, I want to point you to Scripture. Jesus says this, keep watch. If you would have kept watch, you would be ready. Those aren't my words. That is Jesus telling us, He's not saying, oh, just keep living your life, whatever, it doesn't matter. You don't need to think about these things. He's like, no. They're asking him about his return, and he's describing to them, and his action point on this is be alert, be prepared, keep watch. And I think the first step for us for being prepared is being alert and watchful. See, in regards to the Lord's return, Jesus challenges us to keep watch, to be prepared. See, when I was growing up, uh, I used, was a huge fan of G.I. Joe toys. I mean, they were amazing. I had all the G.I. Joe toys. I had the little cards on the back with all the descriptions of them, and I had it filed away in a filing cabinet. And there was a cartoon, the G.I. Joe cartoon that came on, and I would watch it after school. At the end of this cartoon, there was a little segment where they would teach children what to do in case of an emergency or a fire or something like that. And the tagline to this little segment of when they were training kids what to do and equipping children was this, G.I. Joe, knowing is half the battle.
See, ignorance is bliss. And we all may be pretty happy right now. But I think there's a lot of wisdom in us being prepared and cognizant and sober of the times in which we are living. If that seems alarmist to you, let me just pause and say this. If you could go back to the beginning of March 2020 and talk to yourself about what was about to happen, what would you do differently? This whole series is going about getting us prepared to do things differently. See, as followers of Jesus, we are not called to give in to fear. We are anchored in a hope, the hope of eternity, the hope of this coming kingdom. We do not have to be shaken when the world is shaken around us. In fact, if you want to know what that looks like, go back and read the book of Acts. Go back and study church history. When the early church was persecuted and they were shaken on a constant basis, guess what happened? God moved in a powerful and radical way because they could not figure out the Roman government. How can we be persecuting these Christians? And they are unfazed to the point of death in a Colosseum. It's because they were grounded in a type of faith that was unshakable. That is the kind of faith that God is calling us into. Again, I don't know what 2024 holds. And if we get to the end of this year and it was smooth sailing, I am stoked about that. I have no desire for this year to have upheaval and for things to go south, to be clear. But I'm also saying, listen, a lot of the voices I listen to, my own discernment, my own prayer, I did not preach this lightly. I want you to know I wrestled this week in prayer. Lord, how is this going to come across? Is this going to cause people to be afraid? But I kept on feeling this sense from the Spirit of God, you are to prepare your people for anything that's coming. And right here in the middle of the city, God is calling our church to be something. I want to call the worship team to come back up. See, we are called to be a lighthouse shining in the darkness as a church. We are called to be an unshakable church founded in the unshakable kingdom because we are grounded and rooted and following the unshakable king. We are called to pull people out of the kingdom of darkness into his wonderful light. We are going to inherit an eternal kingdom with Jesus that is beyond our wildest dreams. It's better than anything we could imagine or ask or dream of. He is coming back for us. And there's a scripture that I want to anchor us in during this sermon series. I'm going to bring it up every single week because this is where I want to land today. In fact, last night I changed the entire last page of my sermon because I felt this is where we need to land as a church as we go through this series for the next six weeks. One of my favorite scriptures, and I happened to pull up the Amplified Translation because I memorized it first off in the Amplified Translation. The Amplified just kind of expounds on the original Greek words. But, but I, I think in the midst of this series, in the midst of the things I'm sharing with you, this is the place we land as followers of Jesus. Let me read this verse to you. 2 Timothy 1 verse 7, Amplified Translation. This is the God we serve. For God did not give us a spirit of timidity or cowardice or fear, but he has given us a spirit of power, of love, of sound judgment, and personal discipline, abilities that result in a calm and well-balanced mind and self-control. Here's what I believe the call of the church is for 2024. Regardless of what happens in our country, regardless of what happens in the world, regardless of what happens in our culture, we are to be a people who are serving a God that has inhabited our lives with his Holy Spirit, And his spirit establishes within us no fear, but we are walking in power and love and sound judgment and personal discipline, which results with calm, a peace that surpasses understanding, a well-balanced mind, and self-control. I want to invite you to stand this morning. So church, my exhortation for you today is this. Be alert, but do not be afraid. The battle belongs to the Lord. Be awake and be discerning of the times in which we live in, but do not give in to fear because we serve a God 
who reigns over all, and the battle belongs to the Lord. See, the scriptures say we are sojourners, strangers in a foreign land. This is a temporary stop, but there is an eternal kingdom coming that will be established because the battle belongs to the Lord. We have a hope. We have an anchor in Jesus, the Savior, the lover of our souls, the one who gave everything to come and redeem and purchase us with his very own blood and sacrifice. And we learned and we saw on Calvary and the cross that the battle belongs to the Lord. So this morning, we will not give in to fear. We will not give in to intrepidation, no matter what this year holds. We will double down and know that we serve the unshakable king who is bringing an unshakable kingdom and the battle belongs to the Lord. Let me pray for us this morning and then we are gonna worship together as a church, as response. Jesus, we come to you today and I ask this morning as I preach my prayer right now that no fear would grip our hearts, that this would not land in a place to make us anxious, to affect our mental health, Lord, but we would press in to you, Lord, that we would heed the call to press into our Jesus, to anchor the roots of our mind and our heart and our lives and our habits into a place where we are firmly rooted in you. That no matter what comes our way, the world will look at our lives and see that we are a people firmly rooted in the unshakable one, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, and we will proudly declare that the battle belongs to the Lord.